Good afternoon, this is Dr. Bones live with Forgotten Bee for the Bones and Bee Banter with our special guest Mike and Lynn there at Fruit Bat and Grumbling Gargoyle. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> so, <laughs> Great to have you. That was our, that was our grass cutter in, intro there. I don't know if you could hear it very well. Mine, mine kept going a bit fuzzy, but I don't know why. But um, yeah, fantastic that our intro by Gross got to that. So anyway, Lynn, I was going to ask you, um, as the wonderful poet you are, when did you first start to view yourself as a poet? Well, that, that was by accident. Everything I do is by accident. <laughs> <laughs> Much like my birth. <laughs> but, um, it just came about through Twitter, to be honest. It was the, the I like to get all as much emotion as the 140 character, you know, the, the restriction. Yeah. Um, so it kind of extended from that point. Um, evolved, differently, evolved different feelings in people through, through as many forms as I could. Um, but poetry did, I, I seem to slip into that more comfortably than, than the actual writing a novel, for example. So that's, yeah, that's pretty much how it happened. Um, so, so before, so before social media, did you do any kind of poetry before that? Then very, very limited, really. But that was more due to circumstance, lack of lack of uh, the time to do it through work and yeah, and other yeah. things. So recently, I've had more opportunity to, to settle into it and to continue with the poetry. But I do like to write other things as well. You know, jump. I'm not just restricted to poetry, but poetry does tend to favour me. Yeah. Um, I mean, I just wondered, where, where did the sort of alias of Grumbling Gargoyle come from? I mean, what, you know, what made you think of using that sort of for Twitter? I like, I like the gargoyle, you know, the, the, the identity of the gargoyle, this grotesque, which the other pedant will say that if you look at my avatar, I, I'm without a spouse. So therefore, I'm a grotesque. And because I very much view myself to be a grotesque, it's oh. seems very fitting. Yeah, I know, I know. Oh. That's <laughs> awful. Yeah, you know, it's true. It's what Michael calls me every day, my god woman, you know, turn me the way I can't bear to look. Um, <laughs> so I I prefer to hide behind that persona and yes, the girls will too. My personality. <laughs> Hard <Hard-stony. laughs> no, it's, it's something I'm very lovely. <laughs> Well, just a, a quick little thing on gargoyles. Initially, the, the purpose was uh, for them, they were initially uh, constructed to actually ward off evil. I guess you guys didn't know um, that. <laughs> did you know that? I, I, I did, but I think uh, that it's, that's kind of the, but that's more myth than it is factual. Okay. More, but but um, I quite, I'll go with that, yeah, I like it. I also like the idea of attracting evil, but yeah. <laughs> that gives me the substance of poetry, <laughs> and I need that. Well, <laughs> so, well, either you... way, attract it, spell it. Well, and that, that works though, because it gives you more of a, it gives you more of a spectrum to write with, right? Oh, it does. My God, misery is my muse. <laughs> it's being <done> miserable. <laughs> Thunder, lightning, plague, pestilence. I'm the gargoyle. I write about it and about it and dream about it. Worrying, really, isn't it? <laughs> and probably why I'm wearing this straight jacket as I'm speaking to you. <laughs> <laughs> and we can't see, so we don't know. <laughs> I'll, I'll rattle the chair in a minute. <laughs> so, so you've recently had a book published um, called Darkness and Decadence, um, which I've bought myself, and I absolutely love the mix that you've got there between sort of humour, the darkness comes through, but there is an element of sort of 
love and sort of day-to-day life it's not all sort of dark um and on the back of it is a beautiful picture of you oh i've got the bottom shot (laughs) (laughs) and without the stony garb and and um very nice gentleman dead totally he totally he he did he went to a cemetery where i I like to hang out this doesn't sound well does it (laughs) Not, not yeah. that I'm the one who goes from flower to flower and is, yeah, it's like you can't hang out in cemeteries. <laughs> yeah, I quite like those places. Anyway, the that photograph. Thanks for No. So, I mean, go ahead. Sorry, sorry I was going to say, um, so you were going to read to us, weren't you, one of your poems from your book? Yes. Um, this one I, I chose to do is, it's the love, but it's, Quite light-hearted, and um, it's a bit like if Jeremy Carr did Romeo and Juliet, you know that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> the lovers. Her name was Alice, and she worked in Elsa. She'd just been promoted from pet food to pastor. She fancied getting married, and she hoped maybe he'd ask her one day. His name was Martin, and he was on probation for going into world and nicking a playstation. He quite fancied an asbo and a gangster reputation. What a crap. Today she was excited. After work he said he'd meet her. So at break she'd have a spray tan and for lunch pie with rye pizza. She super glued her nails on and her would look much neater later on. He just had a tattoo done, his third attempt at trying, to get through the procedure without persistent crying. His mum had to collect him, but he told her he was dying. Such a knob. <laughs> <laughs> so Alice, she's now over, all blinged up to meet her date, was suddenly heartbroken and instantly irate to see Martin chatting up Chantel, who worked on Freshly Baked. What to do? Then Martin noticed Alice, the Hannah's life became much scarier. And she walked up and drop kicked him right in his thick posterior. <laughs> landed to the words, unwanted item in bagging area. No said. So the moral of the story is, Matthew, don't try to be notorious when all you're really doing is absolutely boring us. You pathetic little wink. Ta da! Well, that, 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 that's it. That's the other Round of applause. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Back to my gutter for me. That's fabulous. That's brilliant. I love it. I love the the humour in that. Yeah. So, so you you're transferring um, your poetry now to stand up. Is that, uh, am I thinking correctly? The yeah, performance. Yeah, the spoken word. Yeah. Um, and I'm um, doing. Michael's arranged for me to do the uh, a slot at the Manchester Fringe in July, July twenty fourth, in Nexus Cafe. So that should be That's interesting. Fantastic. Yeah. That's brilliant. <laughs> So how, how do you feel about doing that? Um, very, very nervous because I don't really like to go beyond where I am. So it's, you know, it's completely stepping out of a place where I feel safe. But you've got to do these things sometimes to, to move beyond, don't you, the comfortable place. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm nervous. And I mean, have you, how many have you done so far? Just, just one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Locked in a cupboard, you know, no, just one. It was um, my the book launch. And so I did my little bit there and people seemed, seemed to like it. I mean, they couldn't see that for me, you know, all the reading the poetry, they, could, they couldn't see how I was feeling, but, um, which is good because I must have got away with it. Different ones better than um, life. I noticed in your acknowledgements you mentioned sort of your children. I mean, how do they feel about you being published and now, obviously, sort of doing the spoken word? Well, they can't wait for me to be famous, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> they like selfishly. But they, feel <laughs> they were deprived of. No, they were very proud, really proud, um, which is nice. And... I didn't, I didn't have to bribe them, you know, for the compliments. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm glad that they are happy. You know, but this, this spoken word, I mean, I know you said that when you're very, you know, you're very nervous and did it once already, but it's just like anything else. I think once you get going a few times, you get more and more comfortable with it. But with some of the stuff you've written, I mean, I think it'd be a lot cooler to see it uh, spoken word and live just because 
there, there can be uh, so much more put into it. I mean, people would be able to see the, the kind of heart and soul you put into it or just, uh, uh, we'll call it like animation uh, when, you're, when you're telling the telling the poem or reading the poem or doing the spoken word. Yeah, I mean, it, it's true because different poems are, are written from different different uh, circumstances, but you're never quite expecting that. You know, one poem, I was walking past a, um, a retirement home one day and there'd been a death and that poem's called Remove and it's about the, all the woman's bits being taken out, all of her personal items, quite rashly, quite irreverently by the removal men. And um, I felt sorry for all of her things exposed in, the, in this, in this truck. So I wrote about that. And then another time, something more comedic will happen. And you, you write about that, but it's not really with any intent. I don't want to do that. The poem kind of finds me, or a little trigger, a little word, and I write things around it. But it's to stand up and speak it, because I've already got the emotion behind it, because I've witnessed it. Right. It's easier to speak, to narrate it to, to people, you know, who are drunk enough to attend. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you use a sort of script, or are you sort of memorising some of the poems? I, I try to memorise some, but I can barely remember my name, you know. <laughs> I do that pretty well, because that not help. It's nice to have a backup. Um, Definitely, because I couldn't remember all of them. Some were quite lengthy, and yeah, so I, I do have a script. I, th I think also, I think trying to get the emotion over as well, I think, you know, to have kind of the backup, like you say, in a script, I don't think that matters because it's how you're actually performing it, isn't it, as well? Yeah, true. yeah that's, that's very true. I mean, essentially, I, I'd like people to, I'd like to be able to present my words enough to some people going away feeling happy, um, a little bit sad, yeah. um, to do, um, not to any kind of depressive state, but I'd like, I'd like them to go away taking bits from the, my thoughts and keeping them in their head and thinking about them properly, you know, and yeah. Well, I, I suppose that's part of being entertained, isn't it, where there's a level of you know, you're drawing on emotions, and that's what we go to the cinema for, isn't it? Or anything, or theatre. So that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. As as with any art form, as long as it communicates, as long as somebody. I mean, sometimes with a poem, I don't really like to tell the story behind the poem that I've written, because I like other people to hear it and to pick up their thoughts and their feelings that they are generated from it, their own little story, because. If I were to always tell them why I'd written that poem, I'm making them, I'm guiding them along a different path of their own. I'm distracting them from their own thoughts. Yeah, no, I think that's right, probably. And that wouldn't be fair. I think. Yeah. yeah. I, I think with a lot of musicians, it's the same thing, isn't it? How they've written the song and how you perceive it as the listener is is a totally probably a different end of the spectrum, but it doesn't matter because it's how that kind of music or poetry, you know, grabs you. Yeah, I think it's, I think with any art form, it tells you as much about um, the reader as it does the writer or the viewer as it does the artist. If you, if you were to write, you know, your thoughts on a piece, no matter in which form it takes itself, it would be an interest, interesting to find out each in, uh, in from each person what they glean from that piece I think that would be very interesting yeah so so with the book deal how how, how did that come about I mean how were you approached and who, by who I was I was on Twitter um as usual and mm -hmm. I was putting up poems out and on this occasion a, a gentleman Kensington Gore who has a publishing company <coughs> in America I believe he knew his friend 